thanks to our sponsors. Hope you had a good lunch. And speaking of lunch, if we could play a little game here. Let's say we're going for dinner after the conference. Which one would you go for? So just, I want every one of you to pick one, give you five seconds. Two, one, okay, easy enough, right? Now, uh, one last thing, sorry if you're healthy, we're actually going to the pizza place. And if you could help me take the orders and tell me which pizza you would like to go with. <laughs> yeah, so I guess we've all been in this situation before. Uh, my name is Phil Delaland, and I'm a UX consultant at Redify, and we're going to look at some principles, laws, effects that influence the way people perceive life, and by extension, digital products. Psychology is central to product development, and that's because product development is not about products. Product development is about people. So if you missed the last few years in software development, we move from what I call, or we're moving, from what I call product-centered design, which is quite easy. You come up with your vision of a product, you push it down to users, if they get it, you're a champion. If they don't, they're a little bit stupid. <laughs> moving on to human-centered design, which as you can see is a little trickier, because people are complex, diverse, they are nonsensical at times. And understanding people is key to understanding how to build good products for those people. To which point you're gonna say, that's cool, because I am a human, so it should be okay. Right? Well, that's my mantra, by the way. It's called the egocentric bias. Um, and it's, it says that we tend to overestimate um, how our opinions, beliefs, preferences, values, habits, are normal of other people. Now, I'm not a trained psychologist, but psychology helps us understand about bias. We talked a fair bit about bias today, about perception, about emotions. It helps us understand about social, cognitive, cultural influences. If we come back to our pizza menu, that's an example of the paradox of choice. It's quite well known, or the choice overload. Now, paradoxically, if I give you no options, and I go, we're all having a Hawaiian pizza, maybe a few are gonna go, yay, and maybe some other people are gonna go, I hate pineapple. <laughs> Fair enough, so let's give people options. After a certain amount of options, you get to decision fatigue. That's what I call the Baskin-Robbins effect. <laughs> and I practice it every week. <laughs> so apparently we make, according to a study by Columbia University, about 70 decisions a day. But another study uh, says that if you count remotely conscious decisions, it goes up to 35,000 decisions a day. Shall I scratch my right or my left eyebrow? OK, well, that adds up. Limiting the options is going to reduce the cognitive load. And cognitive load is pretty much the amount of information your brain, it's your RAM, it's your brain's RAM. Talking to experts here, so. So this law is known as Higgs law, or the Higgs-Hyman law. It's very simple. And a lot of what we're going to talk about today is common sense. The thing is we need to know when to apply it to building products. And that says that the more choices you have, the longer it takes to make decisions. Now, I was on this music mastering platform a year ago. It was quite different to that. That's what it looks like today. I couldn't find the screens. But each one of those pricing tiers would lead to a page with another four or five pricing tiers. That was 16 to 20 pricing options on different pages. I might. Yeah, I was going to go to another product, another website. I wrote to them instead. Hey, have you heard of Fitzlo? <laughs> well, now they've got four options, and I believe it's thanks to me. But it, <laughs> <laughs> we all do that, right? It could be better with the von Restorff effect, or uh, also known as the isolation effect. So when you have multiple, multiple similar objects, 
the one that stands out, that's different, is going to be more easily remembered. Now, you may say we don't want people necessarily to remember our user interfaces or the layouts of our products, but if it's easy to memorize, it's also easier the next time you come to find your way around it. If we use another pricing table here, you can see that one of them has been highlighted as recommended. If you go back to the pizza place, it can help if the waiter goes, well, our special, we're really good at it, is the margarita. And you're going to go, yay, I'll go with that. Or maybe not, but that reinforces your decision. Uh, another takeaway would be to have clear action buttons in your interfaces. And not only, but also menu, highlighted menu item. Talking of cognitive load, what do you see here? A lot of dots. Well, the, the law of common region says that elements tend to be perceived into groups in groups if they are sharing um, an area with a clearly defined border. So it's very simple, again. But unless you do that, you go from a big mess to something that's more manageable by the cognitive load. Very close to that no pun intended, is the law of proximity, which is basically the same, but using white space or using elements in different spaces. A takeaway for this is, well, for example, if you mix important content with ads, for example, in the same area, people may think your content is an ad. Another two quick takeaways on the left. One of those beautiful uh, IT parts websites <laughs> with about 150 items without any kind of structure on the left. And on the right, you can see things have been chunked together. And you may wonder how much is too much, actually. When, what, what is manageable and what's not? Well, there's a law for that. It's Miller's law. And Miller's law, you can take different ways. But basically, it says the average person can keep seven items in their working memory. <coughs> I know you're not the average person. Maybe you can go up to 14, 50, or if you're a rain man, many more. But the reality is seven plus or minus two. There's another side to it. At any moment, you can detect about seven objects in your environment. That is useful. Uh, for example, if I'm designing a website, I'm going to make sure the main navigation, the main menu, doesn't go away over seven, eight, nine items. If not, I'm going to think about my architecture again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Someone act into my slideshow. <laughs> well, it won't happen again. Oh, <laughs> I hope it will. <laughs> Did you know that in the 70s, people thought it was OK for computers to take approximately two seconds to respond to user input? Well, of course, there were technical restrictions back in the days. But still, they thought that with two seconds, users could plan out the next task. And as technology evolved, a gentleman called Walter Doherty of IBM, he noticed that computer performance improved. As computer performance improved, there was a massive increase in productivity. And also, employees got more satisfaction from their work, and work quality tended to improve. So the Doherty threshold is actually a number. It's 400 milliseconds. So it's not, you know, math. But if you keep that interaction to a minimum, that's when you get that result. Now, a little challenge. I would love for all the websites in the world to load under 400 milliseconds. The average time for websites to load on mobile today is 22 seconds. Google strive to go under half a second with all their products. It's good to have challenges in life. Now. On to Jacob's Law. You may have heard of Jacob Nielsen, Nielsen Norman Group, handing out UX certifications these days, very active. He's been around for a long time. Um, and his law is quite cute, actually. He says that users spend most of their time on other people's websites, which means that when they get onto your website, they would appreciate for things to work the same way as they do on other people's websites. I can feel a bit of a grunt. Oh, I don't know, but let's take a metaphor. Have you ever driven a car where the indicator is, is on the wrong side of the steering wheel? Very funny the first time. 
not as funny as the third or fourth. But sometimes you need to make a, make a difference between creativity and usability, right? You need to know the rules before you can break the rules. And if you're reinventing the wheel, well, make sure that it's better than the wheel. If not, what's the point really? Have you ever been on a form like this where the, the, the UX designer very cleverly put a reset or clear button where everybody else puts a save button? <laughs> oh, yes. On to fit slow. Very simple. The time to acquire a target is a factor of the distance to the target and the size of the target. Now, I would argue a lot of us in this room are pretty handy with a mouse. I would even argue maybe some of us are gamers. Well, not everyone is. And there's a few rules to know. We're not going to go through every one of them. I'm just going to illustrate that with an example. The 44 points minimum size on a touch device. But also something like this, for example. Personally, I use keyboard shortcuts. I'm not going to try and click on that thing. The mouse is really far from there. Now, after Jacob's Law, Miller's Law, Fitz's Law, this one is really the most important of all and the one I want you to remember. Cotter's Law. <laughs> won't, won't happen again. No, the next one is actually very cool because it's got the word cocktail in it. It's a cocktail party effect. Imagine. You're at a cocktail party, there's a lot of noise, music, everyone's screaming on top of their heads, voices, and you're trying to have a conversation. Well, your auditory senses do something that's really crazy. They actually cu cut off any external noise so you can try and focus on the person that's talking to you. Well, that text told, tells us about our ability to focus our attention, also to switch our attention. Because sometimes really I'm pretending like I'm talking to someone, but I'm listening to a much more interesting conversation behind me. <laughs> Don't tell me you've never done that. A takeaway. If you look at this page, the first thing you, you think is probably there. But the second thing is, what, what is the goal? What's the aim here? What, wh where do we go? And another thing is really banner blindness. There's a lot of things that look like ads, which means people are not going to look at them, because they aren't. I was talking about Jacob Nielsen. Nielsen Norman Group did studies in the late 90s, and then 10 years later, and then a couple of years back, where they go that, hey, look here. People absolutely ignore the ad, even though the sneaky UX designer ma made that ad look exactly like the rest of the content. Now, nah, I'm not looking at it. When they look at ads, then they repent and never look at it again. It's studies prove it over and over again. I'm not saying we don't need ads. I mean, there's financial realities. But how do you get people's attention? That's a, an example of selective attention, by the way. Well, one way is the serial position effect. So we have found out that people best remember the first and last item in a group of items. Journalists know that, for example. And I would say one takeaway for UX content is not to distill your important information in the middle of the paragraph. No one reads on the web. Come on. You don't believe that, except for the terms and conditions, of course. But no one <laughs> reads anything. Like, they just skim through. So if you don't start with the point, you may lose the point. Ten, the authority principle. Humans tend to comply with people in positions of authority or perceived authority. So it can be physicians, can be policemen, can be lawyers or experts. And that can lead to unethical behaviors, like spamming, for example. Hey, I'm the police. Give me your money. But it can also be used for the greater good altogether. <laughs> the greater good. OK, I'm the only one that's seen that movie then. <laughs> All right. Uh, this website, Passion Planner, uses it in two different ways on this page. One with Amazon's review system, which is quite well known and established. And you know, in general, it's not like two or three people voted or reviewed. So that's one usage of that. But also, the Business Insider. 
quote, the best planner overall. Uh, you've got to understand the Business Insider website is probably ranked on Alexa 300, while um, Fashion Planner is in the hundred of thousands. So you can use photos of people in uniforms, logos, symbols, badges, quotes. <laughs> A little special. Yeah, one over 10. Uh, there's actually many more laws uh, that tend with psychology, but uh, I took the liberty. This one uh, I call the where the heck are you taking me effect. Now, the other day a colleague of mine told me how they got on a train at the right station, at the right time, on the right line, and five minutes into the journey, I'm not saying they weren't a little bit drunk, but five minutes into the journey, they realized they were going south while they wanted to go north. Okay, well, that reveals something. One, it's quite unpleasant to be on a journey without knowing the destination. It can be exciting, but a lot of times in digital products, it is unpleasant. Another thing that can be unpleasant is to be on a journey to a well-defined destination. That, that's basically why we're here. But for some reason, it's like you took an Uber from Perth to Fremantle and you, you're wandering through the streets of Joondalup. Like, man, what are you doing? What are we doing here? And it's kind of a parallel I'd make again back to the pizza shop, you know? Like, oh, you want a margarita pizza, that's cool. Would you like fries with that? You go, oh, that's cool, yeah, why not? Then would you like a massage with it? Or, you know, an insurance policy is like, get out of here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Give me my pizza. <laughs> now, my point is users very kindly offer something very precious, which is their time and their attention. But we shouldn't abuse it and take them on journeys that they're not here for, they're not signed up for it, and basically it's going to piss them off. Uh, a takeaway from this law of where the heck are you taking me is it's always good to use a progress indicator on paginated forms, for example. But I'm also thinking at a much higher level in the product's architecture, in the navigation, in the flows, to always indicate clearly the destination and the itinerary where you are on the map. Now we've seen a few points, like I was saying, there's many more. But a few takeaways, you will notice, they, they go towards simplification. That's one important thing. That less is more. Avoid unnecessary elements or tasks. Minimize choices. Chunks elements together. You need to do the hard work, not the users. Use consistency. Respect the users. But another one would be to test. Test your interfaces, test your products regularly. It's a two-way conversation with the users. Why? Technology evolves. The technology six months ago is different to technology in six months. You cannot rely on studies d done two years ago. In certain areas, things have changed dramatically. So not only technology evolves, but people evolve. Society evolves. If you want to dig a little bit deeper, you've got the Gestalt principles that you can look up. Also, this amazing website, lawsofux.com, which inspired some of our designs here. Um, they actually come with those beautiful posters you can hang around your house, and your partner will love it. <laughs> but remember that you are not the user, and thank you. <laughs>